Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday Eating Bible class. This is Mike McDaniel, the Evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. Now, we have just ended a wonderful gospel meeting on Facing the Future. I enjoyed it and was encouraged so much by the splendid lessons that we heard. If you have not had the opportunity to listen to all the lessons, just stop this video right now and uh, go back and, and listen to those videos. And then after you've done that, then come and listen to this one. They were tremendous. We closed out last night with Brother Clark's great lesson. And uh, we are embedding that video along with this one in uh, our midweek newsletter this week. Uh, we sent out the other links earlier in the week. And uh, we'll probably have those links again in the newsletter today. So be sure and listen to every lesson in this gospel meeting, and you will be glad that you did. Now, last uh, Wednesday, I spoke on the greatness of John 3.16. You may not remember that, but I did. And today, I want to <coughs> show you how John 3.16 is a refuter of religious error. Can it really be that John 3.16 is a refuter of error? I, I know that must sound strange in the ears of a lot of people. It goes against the grain of what some people have uh, imagined John 3.16 to do and, and to be. A lot of people have held on to the idea that John 3.16 uh, provides an attractive umbrella under which they could live regardless of what whatever they may have adop adopted, and uh, they may feel that it extends comfort to people of, of all religious types. But the truth is, there's not another verse in the Bible, really, that refutes more religious error than John 3.16. Of course, the Apostle John wrote this passage. He wrote it from a heart of love. He wrote it in regard to the God of love, and yet he refuted so much error in it. For God. Now here's a refutation of atheism, humanism, and agnosticism. Because this verse reveals God. Atheism denies God in the inspiration of the Bible and seeks to undermine our faith uh, in God. And in the same fashion, humanism says man is in a cold, friendless world, and we don't have a creator. And uh, if God was marked out of John 3.16, there would not be present the great love of God or the Savior to, to save us or redemption being available. But if John 3.16 is so, then the atheist and the humanist ought to think upon the words of the psalmist in Psalm 14, 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. John 3, 16 strikes at uh, atheism and at humanism. Here we see that we do have a God. There is a God. He is our creator. He is our provider. And he is our uh, redeemer. For God also refutes agnosticism. Agnosticism is a philosophy that claims that uh, nothing can be known. For example, the agnostic would claim that he could know that uh, this or that woman is his mother. Well, it's silly, isn't it? But he would say he could only believe that the evidence pointed to more than one option than, than to the others. The logical end of that thinking drives one to conclude, I don't know that God exists. I don't know that the Bible is God's word. I don't know that baptism is for the remission of sins and that's required to salvation. In fact, I don't even know that I do not know those things. In John 8, 32, Jesus said, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And in 1 John 5, 13, John said, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. 
If we cannot know with certainty anything, then John was just flat out wrong when he said that they could know, his readers could know that they possessed eternal life. John 3.16 reveals God, and therefore it refutes agnosticism, humanism, and atheism. For God so loved. Friends, that denies the doctrine of deism. You know, deism says God created the world and walked off and left it. That he wound up the world like a clock and then just stepped out of the picture and he's allowing the universe to unwind. According to deism, God, God doesn't have any further interest in his creation whatsoever. Well, if John 3.16 is true, then deism is false to the core. Nobody can be a, a, a deist and believe in John 3.16. John 3.16 states not only that there is a God, but he's a God that is concerned about mankind. In fact, God was so concerned for us that he sent his only begotten son to walk among men and to die the death of the cross. God is the creator of his creation. He is also in the middle of its continuation. There is a God in heaven. He rules in the kingdoms of men. So says Daniel 4.25. He's in the driver's seat. Always has been, always will be. Deism says, well, God, God doesn't care about us anymore. No, Christianity says God does care. Poor God so loved. And then the world. And that strikes a blow at the Calvinistic doctrine of limited atonement. Are you familiar with that? That doctrine of Calvinism teaches that Christ died only for the elect. That's what they mean by limited, limited atonement. That Christ didn't die for everybody. That he died only for those God handpicked. Ah, not so, says John 3.16. For God so loved the world. God loves all the people of the world. And therefore he made provision for all to be saved if they choose. John 1.29, the next day, John said Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus made provisions for the sin of the whole world. In Hebrews 2 and verse 9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for a limited amount of people, for the elect that God chose. No. For every. Every man. If John 3.16 is true, then this, this gives a fatal blow to Calvinism. Nobody can believe totally in Calvinism and believe in John 3.16. You can't fit Calvinism into this verse. There's no way that you can. For the phrase, the world extends God's provisions of redemption. To all the world, not to a select few, whosoever will can come to Jesus and be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave. That flatly does, denies the doctrine of premillennialism. In the heart of this doctrine is that Christ came to earth to restore the physical kingdom of David to Israel, but then Israel didn't accept him as their king, and the Lord was frustrated, they say. Frustrated in his mission, and, and that this was totally unforeseen, they think, and uh, this is said to have caused the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies to be postponed, and so they set the church up as a substitute, as a substitute arrangement. 
a contingency, a plan B, a plan B, until Christ comes again the second time. And then in his second coming, they say, Christ will then set up his kingdom and reign on David's throne in earthly Jerusalem for a literal thousand years. Friends, we need to realize that the doctrine of premillennialism is not just harmless speculation about supposed unfulfilled prophecy. It's unbelief. Rank. Unbelief. This theory changes the mission of Christ to the world and, and makes the death of Christ an accident. And the church a plan B. Why did my Savior come to earth? And to the humble go. Well, in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief, Paul said. In 1 John 4 and verse 14, we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Now, did Jesus come to set up some material kingdom? Or did Jesus come to be the Savior of the world and to die for the sins of the world? To say that Jesus formed the purpose of dying for men after opposition to him by the Jews is just a futile attempt to evade the plain statements of the scriptures. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God sent Jesus that he might give him up, that he might die for the sins of man. He did not send his only begotten son to build an earthly kingdom. Jesus came to die. And he came to pay for the church with his own precious blood. Acts 20, verse 28. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now I look at that and I say, that denies modernism. You know it. Modernism denies the deity, the virgin birth, the miracles and the resurrection of Christ and the inspiration of the Bible. But John 3.16 asserts the virgin birth in that phrase, only begotten son. Not only that, it also denies Judaism too. Judaism denies that Jesus of Nazareth is the long-awaited Messiah. But John 3.16 asserts that Jesus is the Messiah. If John 3.16 is so, and it is, and Jesus is God's only begotten Son, then modernism and Judaism are both false to the core. And I might add to that, this phrase, only begotten son, also refutes oneness Pentecostalism. Oneness Pentecostalism denies more than one personality in the Godhead. That doctrine contends for Jesus only as constituting the entire Godhead, but John 3.16 demonstrates God and Christ as two distinct personalities, both partaking of the nature of God, of the divine nature. In John 3.16, you got the sender and you got the sent, right? And the sender and the sent are not the same. The sender did not send himself. The sent did not send the sender. John 3.16 states that there is a father who stayed up in heaven and there is a son who came to the earth and where there is a father and son relationship, we have more than one personality. In John 3.16, we have two members of the Godhead, not just one. And there are other passages like Matthew 28.19, 1 Corinthians 13.14, where we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three personalities, and not just one. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever. That word whosoever denies another doctrine of Calvinism. 
Calvinism states that God unchangeably predestined the future of every man before time began on earth without any conditions placed upon man, and therefore only a certain number will be saved. And that's called unconditional election. But that word whosoever in John 3.16 reveals that man has a choice because he was created as a free moral agent and thereby he has the freedom to choose between right and wrong, good or evil, obedience or disobedience. Adam and Eve back there in the garden had a choice. And so do we. Revelation 22.17, the spirit and the bride say, come and let him that hear us say, come and let him that is a thirst come and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him. Hmm. You know, that denies the doctrine of universalism, doesn't it? Universalism teaches that everybody's going to be saved and that nobody will be lost. And it contends that all will be saved with or without saving faith. But that phrase, believeth in him, definitely shows salvation is conditional. And that word believeth, as I mentioned last week, covers the whole process of obedience. When you hear the gospel, when you believe in Christ, when you repent of your sins, when you confess the name of Jesus, and when you're buried in that watery grave of baptism, you possess the kind of obedient faith that will save. In Hebrews 5, 8 and 9, though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Matthew 7, 13 and 14 teaches that not all will be saved. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way which leadeth to destruction. And many there be, Jesus said, which go in thereat. For straight is the gate, and there is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. John 3.16 imposes conditional obedience for salvation. Universalism denies that, and therefore John 3.16 denies the doctrine of universalism. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Those words of John 3.16 in regard to perishing strike down every false religion in the world that would make hell a figment of human imagination. If John 3.16 is true, then the doctrine of no hell is false to the core. These words also deny the doctrine of materialism, which states that death is the final end of man. It teaches that when man dies, it's all over. It's finished. The Greek word for perish does not suggest annihilation as materialists contend. This word is the word used to describe the miserable condition of the prodigal son when he was separated from his father. In that state, the son was apolumai. He was lost. And Vine says, the idea is not extinction, but ruin, loss, not of being, but of well-being. And so this word perish refers to the ruin and destruction of eternal punishment that the disobedient will suffer. Matthew 25, 46, these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Well, we're almost done. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. These words of John 3, 16 in regard to eternal everlasting life refute every form 
of modern and ancient Sadduceeism. Sadduceeism denies that man has a spirit and that there will be a resurrection and there's going to be a future life after this one's over. Uh, friends, if John 3.16 is so, then all the no heaven advocates are put to route too. There is a hell to shun and there is a heaven to be won. The faithful will be rewarded with everlasting communion with God. Now after taking you through this little journey in John 3.16, uh, I just don't know of another verse in, in all the Bible that, that that denies more religious error than does John 3.16. And I probably could have included even more error that it refutes uh, if I desire. But what I wanted to do tonight is sufficient to show you that John 3.16 is a refuter of religious error. It, it refutes a lot of false ideas that are taught and believed in the world today. Friend, if, if you're not in a saved condition, we would encourage you to believe in Jesus, to turn from your sin, confess him, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. To take the Bible as your guide, have the assurance of eternal life which passages just such as John 3.16 afford us. How rich this verse is. And we're blessed to have studied it together. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the great gospel meeting that we had. Bless the seed of the word of God. Bless many that they might watch these videos of these great sermons and be blessed by them as we are who heard them in person. Bless this lesson that I've taught on John 3.16 as a refute of error, that it also might be a blessing to many people. We want to pray, Father, for Brother Larry Powers and the loss of his wife, Teresa. We pray that I would comfort him. We want to pray for David and Susan Mullinix. Is they're battling COVID-19? And we pray, Father, they might get well soon and be able to be back with us. Bless all of those in our community who are suffering at this time. We pray, Father, that we might soon be able to get over this pandemic. Father, we're thankful for Jesus, for the life he lived and the death that he died and for the love of our Father, who gave him for us. And it's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Well, good to be with you. Thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you this Lord's Day morning for worship under our God.